Hello, and welcome to episode number 60 of the Point of Convergence podcast. As always, I am your host, Exo Academian. When it comes to the so-called UFO phenomenon, the levels of complexity go much deeper than the general public and the political and media mainstream generally realize. In other words, the conversation that's finally being had in those circles, because of revelations arising primarily since 2017, is still a far cry from the nature of the discussion being had by people really familiar with the nuances of this thorny but enthralling topic. The first layer is the notion that sophisticated alien entities may be in our midst supposedly piloting, or at least controlling, even if remotely, the strangely exotic craft that have been regularly spotted buzzing in and around our skies. That part of the conversation is finally being had in at least some elements of the mainstream, though widespread acknowledgement of this fact is still a long way off. Further inward from that surface layer of the proverbial onion is discussion regarding how these alien others seem to be both contacting and ongoingly interacting with human beings as we speak, and most likely have been for as long as our species has been around to have such experiences. Another layer deeper from that part of the narrative, which is already much more than the general public and the political and media mainstream are willing to even discuss, is a notion even more shocking, that being that some people are taking a proactive role and are reaching out to these alien others, taking the front foot, as it were, in the contact and communication process. CE5, short for Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, is a term used to describe a certain form of this kind of interaction with alien others. CE5 involves a series of general protocols designed to peacefully invite contact with sophisticated non-human intelligence. A person may, for instance, communicate via the aid of meditation and directed intention a desire to see a craft, presumed by many, if not most, to be extraterrestrial in origin, to show itself in a particular place in the sky at a particular time. Interestingly, while CE5 is the most familiar form of proactive, human-initiated contact with apparently non-human alien intelligence, it is not the only method that has and is being employed. Astral travel is another form of contact slash communication slash communion that is being used to reach out and bridge whatever divide separates us and them. Of course, the fact that astral travel seems to, after the correct kind of training and preparation, be just as effective in achieving this close encounter contact as is CE5, this only begs the question as to the nature of the divide that does actually separate us from them. Indeed, the fact that we seem to be able to travel via consciousness, as it were, without physically going anywhere, and still not only contact these alien others, but even spend time aboard their in-orbit spacecraft, suggests that the nature of the contact, or at least some of it, is perhaps not what many first assume it to be. And really, once you really think about it, it becomes clear that the implications here even call into question the very nature of what we call reality. Without doubt, these implications are as fascinating as they are mind-bending, and are, without question, as simultaneously bizarre as they are profound. And these are the very matters we'll seek to delve deep into in this, the 60th episode of the Point of Convergence podcast. As I already mentioned in the introduction, for some people, the notion that these others are contacting people and then apparently taking them from their homes and up into their craft is already a stretch too far. The main reason for this lack of belief, of course, is that this is not happening to them personally. They also tend to believe that if such a thing were going on, we would be hearing about it in the mainstream media. Of course, this is not how such things work. There is a notion of what we call consensus reality, and that is not the sum total of all that happens, but it is what the mainstream is willing to discuss. We should always remember that this notion of a consensus reality, which evolves over time of course, is as much about a narrative we tell ourselves 
as it is an objective truth referencing what's out there. In fact, this notion of an objective truth out there, as if we're in a position to know it, to perceive it directly, to apprehend it, is already a dicey assumption. But we'll save a deep dive into that for another time, although we will touch on it again a little bit later in this podcast. Now, beyond the notion of these others contacting and interacting with us at their whim, apparently, beyond all that is this next level notion we discussed in the introduction that of human beings actually proactively reaching out to initiate contact and communication with these alien others, and apparently successfully. As I said in the introduction, this is a step even beyond what some who accept notion number one, they're here, and notion number two, they choose to interact with us at their whim, can handle. And yet, there is a wealth of evidence to suggest that these human-initiated contact events do actually take place, and that even more interestingly, they actually work. In other words, when people use directed intention and a positive mindset to invite the presence of these others, they do actually often show up, often at the very time and place expected. What people then observe are lights in the sky of a non-prosaic nature, or what look to be solid craft around the sky, often doing exactly the maneuvers that the people on the ground watching them ask to see like move to the left, now to the right, blink three times, etc. Some people will even bring high-powered flashlights or lasers to signal these craft directly. This is CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, also known as Human Initiated Contact Events, HICE. And again, it works. It's very difficult to disagree with the data as to this point. It doesn't work all the time. It doesn't work for everyone but the data clearly points to the fact that this does actually work and surprisingly often, and by following this very same protocol involving meditation, directed intention, etc. Lastly, we should also point out that the vast, vast majority of these kinds of encounters with these particular alien others end up being positive encounters. I know people who've been in these circles for decades, James Iandoli and Joseph Burks being two of them, and they report overwhelmingly positive interactions based on the CE5 or HICE protocols. Does this mean these particular others are of a different nature, a different origin even perhaps, than the others who are abducting people from their beds in the middle of the night? Perhaps. The data does draw a distinction there from what we can tell. So we should at least consider that possibility. As I've said many times on this podcast, amongst the totality of the data, we should look for unique patterns that show up that might indicate to us specific groups within the totality of the UFO phenomenon. But as I said in the introduction, CE5 or HICE, as controversial as it is for some, is actually not the only form of human-initiated contact with this apparently alien others. Another form that is used by some people is what is commonly known as astral travel or astral projection. Now, what is astral projection? According to Wikipedia, quote, astral projection, also known as astral travel, is a term used in esotericism to describe an intentional out-of-body experience, OBE, that assumes the existence of a subtle body called an astral body, through which consciousness can function separately from the physical body and travel throughout the astral plane. The idea of astral travel is ancient and occurs in multiple cultures. The modern terminology of astral projection was coined and promoted by 19th century theosophists. It is sometimes reported in association with dreams and forms of meditation. Some individuals have reported perceptions similar to descriptions of astral projection that were induced through various hallucinogenic and hypnotic means, including self-hypnosis, unquote. Now, what we are discussing today is the fact that there are individuals who employ the techniques of self-hypnosis and astral projection to actually initiate experiences that result in them not just seeing at a distance, as it were, craft or phenomena in their mind's eye version of the night sky, 
Now, while that can and does actually happen, some individuals will employ this form of protocol so as to astrally travel up into the craft of these alien others, where they then can interact with the alien beings aboard those craft. And specifically, we're going to discuss the case of one particular individual who regularly uses these very techniques, and successfully so. Now, while some skeptics within this community might immediately dismiss this notion and draw certain conclusions about the likely nature of this person, it should be noted that this person actually saw himself as much more of a nuts and bolts kind of individual, and he didn't regard himself as particularly spiritual. So it's important to note that from the outset, that this is not merely about the fanciful imagination of a person who already leans in this direction. Interestingly, this person decided to initiate these kinds of contact after having experienced classical abduction encounters, including one that happened with both he and his young infant son. And for the record, he saw these encounters as absolutely terrifying, where he experienced all of the standard paralysis and ontological shock when beings suddenly appeared in his room in the middle of the night, etc., Here is a short bio of the person we're going to discuss today. His name is Peter Whitley. Now, he has been abducted by aliens three times, and he has astrally traveled to unidentified flying objects, the craft used by these beings, apparently, over 40 times. Now, he is originally from the Pacific Northwest region of the United States, but he is now the national director for MUFON of Japan and he's a member of MUFON's Experiencer Research Team. So he enjoyed Japan after visiting there many years and eventually decided to move there and become a permanent resident. Now, as an experiencer himself, his primary focus is on reports of interaction with non-human intelligence, i.e. aliens. More recently, he's been exploring the use of astral travel to gain insight into the activities and motivations of these mysterious others. Now, how does he do this? How does he develop the protocol in the first place to manage to interact with these others via astral travel? Well, he uses techniques he was taught as part of a program run by the Monroe Institute, which is an organization, as many of you might know, that was begun by Robert Monroe in the 1970s, following Monroe's experience of sudden, unpredicted, and at least initially, unwanted out-of-body experiences. Now, parenthetically, a person who was hired to help Monroe to prove the validity of OBEs and even the notion that people can bring these about following certain protocols was none other than Tom Campbell. Tom Campbell is probably known to many of you as a major teacher now that our reality is a simulation of sorts, a virtual reality that is iterated by a consciousness system of which we are a part, and that our local bodies are basically avatars within a simulation. Initially, he was brought on as a physicist to help come up with models, scientific models, to demonstrate the validity of OBEs. But eventually, he himself started having amazing experiences with out-of-body experiences. And to make a long story short, he eventually wrote a book called My Big Toe, which is short for My Big Theory of Everything, And that book entails not just these encounters he had while having out-of-body experiences, but it explains how he was able to test various ideas about reality. And he developed an entire model of reality based on experiments he would basically run while having an out-of-body experience. And he had many, many of these. And he found to his surprise that he was able to have these almost at will. But Tom Campbell and his tale is a tale for another time. We will explore his experiences, as well as his model in a subsequent podcast episode. Let's get back to Peter Whitley and his encounters. Now, the first thing I want to point out here is that, like many people we've discussed on this podcast over 60 episodes now, initially when he had abduction experiences, in other words, when they came to him and took him up onto their craft, While he had experiences that weren't traumatizing in the sense of they didn't do anything to him that seemed harmful, they didn't seem malevolent to him, the experiences were still terrifying initially. That was his experience of them because, again, the ontological shock. These beings showed up in his room in the middle of the night. He couldn't move. 
then he was taken on board a spacecraft, etc. All this was very shocking, both to his understanding of what could happen in reality, and the fact that he seemingly had no control. So initially, terror was his response. However, over time, he began to see it differently. And again, we've talked about this progression in people's interpretation of their experiences many times. It doesn't always happen this way, but it often does. And eventually, curiosity got the better of him. And he thought, perhaps I should try to reach out to them. Perhaps I can learn things about them. So he ended up taking this course from the Monroe Institute that taught him how to astrally project. And then via a combination of what he learned in that course and what he also learned about self-hypnosis, he actually went about recording his own self-hypnosis induction technique. He would record this and then play this back to himself and use the methodologies he's learned through the Monroe course in order to create an out-of-body experience, which would enable him to astrally travel and contact these alien others. And he didn't just call them down. He would actually be able to go up into their craft. Now, of course, the question of in what sense is he going anywhere is a separate question. And we'll get to that. And it is fascinating. And I would say perhaps it is the most important aspect of all these different kinds of cases. And we should pay very close attention to these details because it points to something about the very fabric of reality. Again, more on that later. So what has he learned when he went via astral projection up into the craft and visited these others? By the way, he came across various different kinds of aliens, most commonly the greys though, although he also came across the mantis type and had a long conversation with a particular mantis. Now the greys told him when he asked, that they are biological robots, created biological entities, but unlike us, they do not have souls. Now, he was told there are others, other alien types, that are soulful, so to speak. In other words, they do have souls just like us, but these particular greys do not have souls, apparently. That's what they told him. They are engineered, created, but biological beings. Again, this is, I think, where some of our conceptions kind of collapse. We think of either AI robots as these kind of metallic plastic types, or you have kind of organic biological beings with souls. He's saying that these are some amalgam of the two. They are biological. They are organic in a way. They do develop. They do have personality, but they don't have souls. So they're not quite like us, even though there are alien types that are more like us in that sense. Now, it's also interesting that Perhaps one of the reasons why he steered away from CE5 is because he has never taken well to meditation. Now, for me personally, meditation is a big part of my everyday practice. But for Peter, meditation never really worked for him. So he found that self-hypnosis and astral projection worked better. So maybe that's why he opted for this kind of contact, this kind of initiation, rather than CE5. As I mentioned in the beginning... It's also important to point out that Peter is not a kind of spiritual, woo-woo kind of individual, not a new age kind of individual. He doesn't even consider himself spiritual, really. And he says that if you would have told him that he would be attempting astral travel at some point in his life, five, ten years ago, he would have laughed at you. He would have seen it as an impossibility. It just wasn't who he was. But once he opened his mind to this kind of possibility, and following his abduction encounters, he was willing to try this. And by the way, if you're interested, the course he took is the Monroe Institute's Gateway Experience. And he basically took this on a whim, thought he would try something new. What the heck? We'll see what happens. Little did he know at the time that he would not only have a good experience with this course, but then would be able to almost at will create out-of-body experiences. It happened very commonly for him. It was not a difficult transition. That isn't to say it will be that way for everyone. But he had a particular ability to facilitate these OBEs pretty much at will. Now, of course, based on things we've discussed before, one asks, is it possible that the contact he had with them first when they abducted him could have turned something on in his brain, so to speak, that made him more capable of having OBEs? Because we know these all come together. They all overlap in some way. There is a point of convergence, perhaps. But again, we think of someone like 
Tom Campbell, who we mentioned earlier, and he also found, to his surprise, that he was surprisingly good at OBEs. Although, again, even in his case, it turns out he had experiences as a child with a kind of non-human intelligence. So again, this is all interesting how this overlaps. We're still trying to unravel that. Now, let's get to what he learned, what Peter learned when he was on board the craft communicating with these greys, with the mantis types, etc., with hybrids even. And he remembers all of this. This is conscious memory. It's not like this had to be drug out of him through hypnotic regression or something, even though that's very useful technique for many people who were abducted. But in his case, because he is initiating these encounters, he remembers all of this the same way that he's telling you about what he had for breakfast the day before. And by the way, these are classic OBEs that he's having. Now, to create the OBE, what he would use is a combination of self-hypnosis, like I mentioned, and then he would vibrate his body. And this is a bit too much to get into right here, but you can learn about this if you want to. Basically, he visualizes this energy running up and down his spine, up and down his entire body, and he increases the rate at which it's vibrating. This is sort of via the use of imagination initially. And then you begin to really feel it, and this kind of loosens your astral body from your physical body. And I say it's a classical OBE type experience because when asked, he said that yes, when he would first come out of his body, so to speak, he could look down from the ceiling and still see his body lying on the bed. And he would notice details like the fact that his phone was upside down the way that he had said it just before he tried to induce the OBE. So he really did sense that he was now out of his body and he could actually look down at his physical space and see his physical body from the vantage point of his astral body, which was now on the ceiling. Now, from there, he would travel up to the craft themselves. And it's not like he would actually picture himself going through the sky and after about 25 minutes get there. It's more like a transition happened almost spontaneously. He would go from out of his body, out of the room, and then be up in the craft. Now, while he was on the craft, what did he see? One thing he saw evidence of was the hybridization process, which again is front and center with this phenomenon. We've talked about this many, many times. What he saw at first was what he perceived as human nurses in a kind of futuristic nursery. And in fact, a gray that he was there with asked him if he wanted to hold one of the babies that was being attended to in this nursery. Now, Peter later realized or perceived more directly that these nurses, which he at first saw as kind of humanoid, were actually also greys. And then he saw that the nursery itself was a projection over top of the actual appearance of this part of the interior of the craft. What he saw then, once this kind of projection had been removed, was a sparse area with minimal furnishings. Mostly everything was colored white. And the white light came from the walls themselves. There was no direct source observed as to where the light came from. It just seemed to emanate from the entire interior of the craft. And again, that's something we've heard from people before as well. Now, regarding the fact that he initially perceived these nurses as more humanoid and then later saw them as greys, and the fact that he initially saw this area as a nursery and only later realized it was more sparse than that, he was told by the greys that they will often show us images that are translations, so to speak, to help us make better sense of or relate to what we're seeing. So they told him this, that they do this for our sake. So again, in this kind of subtle reality, what we see is a complex tapestry of what's actually there and what our minds dream up and also what these others facilitate to show us for our sake. And maybe for their sake too. That's something we should consider as well. Many people have questioned whether or not they show us things that are not real for their own purposes. That's quite likely. I will lean towards this being a kind of symbiotic arrangement ultimately, but I'll get to that later. The bottom line is we shouldn't necessarily take every element that is seen as literal. In these subtle realms, there are many nuances here, many subtle layers. But we should note that when he asked to see things as they really are, once he realized that there was a kind of projection going on, a kind of hologram on top of what he was actually seeing, they did show him other images. And he saw something that looked less familiar, less comforting in some ways, but according to what they told him, closer to the actual reality of the interior of the craft. 
Now, something else he saw was another gray in a kind of laboratory area. And again, he makes the point here, Peter does, of saying at least it was presented like a laboratory area. And this gray was using a long metal rod to insert something into a capsule. When he was done inserting something into one capsule, that would shoot away and another one would appear and he would do the same thing. When Peter asked what they were doing, he was basically told by the greys that this is how they manage our evolution, that they're trying to evolve our souls, and then they do it this way. Now, this is interesting because, again, when we think about the evolution of souls, we think of a more spiritual kind of process. But what they're doing here is kind of using chemicals and organics and things like that. Again, maybe we shouldn't take it at face value or maybe it's some amalgam of the two that we don't fully understand yet. In fact, many times they told him he wouldn't really understand if, even if they tried to explain it. But this is what he saw. This gray inserting some sort of substance via a long metal rod into a capsule. And that this somehow was to manage our evolution and to evolve our souls. That's what he was actually told by these grays. Now, I already mentioned that sometimes they kind of intimated that he wouldn't really understand some of the answers that they could give. Many of his questions were dismissed as being misguided, or they would redirect him to a better question, a more helpful question. And that actually seems realistic to me. If they are further along than us, at least these graves that he was interacting with, I'm not saying they all are, but if these particular ones really are further along than us, then it makes sense that sometimes our questions wouldn't be useful because they would be based on assumptions that are faulty. So for this to be a real kind of experience, I would actually expect that this kind of scenario would happen where they would try to redirect us, try to ask better questions, etc. But we should point out that sometimes he just knew that the implication was that he wouldn't understand even if they tried to explain it to him. They were always kind and amicable towards him, but sometimes they wouldn't answer his questions mainly because he didn't have the capacity to understand the answer. Now, another thing one of these grazed asked him was whether or not he would like to hold one of these hybrid babies. And as it turns out, this hybrid baby looked 100% human to him. It wasn't like what we sometimes see, which is a child that looks partially human and partially something like a gray. To Peter's eyes, this baby looked completely human. You wouldn't be able to tell it apart from any other baby in a nursery, for instance, and yet he was told that this was a hybrid baby, and he sensed this as well, which again raises the possibility that these hybrid babies have been introduced into our population and are walking around amongst us, and we are none the wiser. Now, as I already mentioned, Peter goes out of his way to point out that these different graves, and including the mantis that he saw as well, all had unique personalities. So again, I think that challenges some of our assumptions, even though they are beings without souls, apparently, that's what they told him. They are created organic biological beings, some amalgamation of a robot and an organic being. They still had personalities and they still like to experience things. And in fact, one time he had a really profound experience that was also somewhat disconcerting and uncomfortable, where one of the greys asked him if he would like to do a consciousness exchange. Now, we should note here, the gray did ask him. He didn't force it on him. But Peter, being a curious person, agreed, said he would like to try it. What he experienced was suddenly his consciousness was inside a larger container of the gray's consciousness. And it was very foreign feeling to him. And likewise, the gray was able to embody his human form down on earth, his physical form. And Peter also somehow accessed this feeling, was a part of that as well. And the entire experience was very overwhelming and somewhat uncomfortable. And again, we've talked about this before. Some people describe this almost like a feeling of death because we are feeling separated from what we're used to feeling as ourselves. And this great was actually imposing its consciousness after asking that it could do so, we should point out. But it was then interspersing its consciousness within the body of Peter. And Peter experienced this as quite overwhelming and not exactly comfortable. And by the way, he does point out that the greys seem to enjoy the experience, that the greys do like to know what it's like to be human, that that's part of their curiosity. Now, Peter goes on to describe that he has met five distinct alien entities as a part of his astral projection experiences. 
He's met the small grays, the tall grays, a mantis type, as well as the hybrid types. Now, interestingly, one time he met a hybrid that we should describe here because it's very curious. Peter says the hybrid looked pretty much like a full-grown Ken doll. And what he meant by that was that it was a humanoid looking being, a being that basically looked human, but it was too perfect to be human. In other words, it looked like a life-size, fully embodied Ken doll with skin so perfect, it looked unreal. And he was also told by this being, this being that looked like a Ken doll, this hybrid, that while they grow up from babies into adult form, from then on, they actually don't age. And this may be part of the engineering process that has been going on. But we should point out here that Peter was not told that these beings are destined to be implanted on the earth and that they plan to take over or something like that. This being indicated that its home was elsewhere. And we've talked about this many times before too, that many of the humanoid or even human looking beings that are encountered on craft aren't necessarily from the earth, nor are they intended to go to the earth. Some of them live on other planets, and some of them seemingly spend their entire lifetimes on board these craft. Very interesting. Now, something else that Peter describes is going through a kind of virtual reality kind of process where he was entrained to be able to communicate more smoothly with them. And from then on, more of his communication happened with them. One thing that the mantis showed him was this crystal, which was in one part of the craft. And Peter notices that the mantis seems to have an almost worshipful kind of reverence for this crystal. And he says that it's almost like the, the mantis expected him to also have that feeling of reverence. Peter's very honest and says eventually he got bored looking at this crystal after about 20 minutes. Very interesting, these little details. Now, apparently, the mantis says that this crystal was created via this kind of cone that he has also shown. Now, this kind of orange or tan cone was, rever was revered to an even greater degree. And when asked about it, he was told that this cone basically allowed for everything. It allowed for their manner of travel, for the way they powered their craft, everything that it seemed to create the entire scenario that was enabling them to be here in the first place. And Peter asked them, did you create this? Is this part of your technology? And they said, no, we didn't create this. We found it. And very interestingly, they apparently found it eons ago in a period so far back in the history of that species, the mantis types, that Peter couldn't even really wrap his head around it. It happened in ancient history for them eons ago. And apparently it took them a long, long time to learn how to use this cone without being destroyed by it. When initial creatures of the mantis types would actually touch this cone, they would simply dissolve. And basically over millennia, we're talking here, they eventually learned how to use it to harness its power as a means to develop technology, etc. Very interesting here. And this is details I have not heard before. Now in this interview with Peter that I listened to, he says that after his 40 experiences via astral travel, communicating with these others, he decided to take a break, partially because that last encounter where he had the exchange of consciousness, the intermingling of consciousness, was quite overwhelming for him. But he makes it clear that he does intend to pick up the practice again in this year, 2022. Now let's discuss a few takeaways that we can pull from what we've discussed today. Number one, our understanding is always the result of a translation process and depends partly on the level of development and the assumptions and history of the individual being contacted. This partly explains why there is some discrepancy in terms of how people experience the grays and whatnot. And we can learn more by considering the full body of data. In other words, rather than relying too much on any one case, any one encounter, any one remembrance that someone puts forward of encountering these grays, we should look at the full body of data and see patterns and try to draw conclusions from that. I would say that's a more helpful way, a more fruitful way to make sense of this data. Now, speaking of this, the varied encounters suggest there are different groups of grays, perhaps, and maybe even distinct sources for these grays. We shouldn't assume they're all one group. And we've been told by some experiencers, of course, and sometimes by the greys themselves, apparently, that some of these are more like suits that some beings wear, like a gray suit they put on. 
that looks like the gray alien that we're used to, but they wear this in order to be able to enter into our dense 3D reality. Some of them we're told are even more like light beings. They've transcended the need for a physical body, or maybe they never had one to begin with. And they use these kind of suits to be able to enter into our dense reality. Not all of them, but some of them. So again, I think we should be careful to assume that all of this is one group of gray aliens. It most likely is not. Finally, let's reflect on CE5 versus astral projection. Now, let me be clear. Regarding these two types of contact, I don't think one is more real than the other. And if you're still thinking that way, then you haven't fully grasped why this is the case yet. But fear not, we will go into more of this over time. Because it does go against the grain in terms of what we've been taught and in terms of what our senses sometimes deceivingly lead us to believe. But here we should remember what Donald Hoffman, professor of cognitive sciences at the University of California, Irvine, has posited, and convincingly so. He says that our very perception of the world is not a truthful representation of what's actually out there, but rather more like a desktop computer interface, full of icons that help us navigate reality. This desktop interface is what evolution has served up so as to serve its purpose of keeping us alive and therefore allowing us to reproduce. Again, this is a lot to wrap one's head around. If it still feels abstract, obtuse, and difficult to digest, fear not, we will be discussing and developing these notions much more over time. And cases like that of Peter Whitley that we discussed today help provide the background evidence to lead us in this new direction. A direction that, as I've been saying, points squarely at the very fabric of ultimate reality. And to clarify, what I mean by that is that our current model, our current mainstream model, as to the nature of ultimate reality, is shown to be inadequate. In fact, I would argue, grossly misguided by revelations we've been discussing over the last 60 episodes. And I would suggest to you that the truth behind the UFO phenomenon and other forms of so-called high strangeness lie precisely there and nowhere else. And on that note, we've come to the close of another edition of the Point of Convergence podcast. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so at patreon.com slash exoacadamian. But until next time, friends, from deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, this is Exoacadamian, signing out.